Good morning, and you're welcome to today's Signpost webinar. My name is Mark Gibson, and I'm the manager of the Chagas Connected program. Wherever you're joining us from today, we do hope that you're keeping safe and well. Uh, the Signpost webinar series is brought to you in association with the National Rural Network, Food Drink Ireland, and Dairy Sustainability Ireland. In his address to the UN Security Council this week, David Attenborough said, if we continue on our current path, we will face the collapse of everything that gives us our security, food production, access to fresh water, habitable ambient temperature, and ocean food chains. Self-Help Africa is a leading international development charity with an expertise in small-scale farming and growing family farm businesses, and is dedicated to ending hunger and poverty in rural Africa. And I'm delighted to be joined by Paul Wagstaff, who is Senior Agricultural Advisor with Self-Help Africa. Paul, you're very welcome to the Signpost webinar. Thank you very much. And it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to have an opportunity to present to so many people who are experts in, in agriculture and experts in the, in the sustainability of agriculture systems. Um, so this morning, I'd like to talk about agriculture in the tropics and how climate change is will affect smallholder farmers. I'm going to focus on the smallholder farming sector rather than the commercial for large scale farming sector. Um, so how climate change will impact on people's livelihoods, on crop production, livestock production, and the kind of interventions that an NGO like South Africa can use to try and uh, reduce the impacts of climate change. Excellent, excellent. And, and we're also joined by Pat Murphy, uh, who is the head of the Chagask Environment Knowledge Transfer Programme. Pat, good morning to you. Good morning. Delighted to be here. Great, great. Um, so, Paul, could you tell us a little bit about your, your own history or your own background? I know you've been working in uh, overseas development for quite, quite some years now at this stage. Yes, uh, I started my career in tropical agriculture way back at the end of the 80s when I worked for the Tanzania Ministry of Agriculture as a in, on the ground as an agricultural extension officer, much the same as you were doing, Mark, in your, in your younger days. Mm -hmm. And I was working with farmers in Tanzania around Lake Victoria. Um, since then, I've moved across Africa, um, worked across East Africa, uh, and worked a little bit in, in Asia as well. Brilliant, brilliant. Okay, well, uh, Paul, if uh, we could ask you to, to maybe get your, your slides prepared there, and just while you're doing that, to let everybody know that if you have questions or comments for uh, Paul, uh, for the, at the end of the, the webinar, we'll certainly put those to, to Paul, but you can use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen uh, to, to submit those questions. Um, and also to remind everybody that today's webinar is being re recorded and a copy of Paul's presentation will be available on the Chagas website afterwards as well. So, uh, Paul, when you're ready, we'll just uh, keep just getting your slides organized there um, and uh, we shall talk to you afterwards. Great, thank you very much. So, um, this morning I'd like to talk about the impact of climate change on smallholder food production in the tropics. So just to introduce ourselves, um, I work for Self Help Africa, which is uh, an NGO. Um, we're based in Ireland and the UK. We have offices in Belfast, London, Shrewsbury and uh, New York. And we're currently working in Burkina Faso, um, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Kenya, Malawi, Togo, Uganda and Zambia. So we are we're Africa focused. Uh, we don't have any work in Asia. Um, and we are somewhat unusual as, a, as an NGO, as a dump NGO, in that we are a mixture of uh, commercial and non-profit organisations. So we're part of the larger Goethe Group. So South Up Africa is the, the non-profit in the Goethe Group. Um, then we have the True Trade, which is an online trading platform for farmers to trade their produce in Africa. And Partner Africa, which is a consultancy company, but <coughs> that audits supply chains for companies across the world. Um, so they're working for some of the largest uh, players in the food industry, auditing their supply chains to uh, make sure there's no, uh, no skeletons hiding in the closets. Okay, so uh, I'd better start by uh, a quick description of where the tropics are. So when we talk about tropical agriculture, where are the tropics? So the tropics are defined by the uh, Tropic of Cancer in the north, um, it's 23 degrees, 26 minutes north of the equator and the Tropic of Cancer south of the equator. Um, 
the tropics are the area of the Earth's surface where the sun will be overhead at least once in the year. So uh, no matter how long we wait, the sun will never be overhead in Ireland. Um, so that's the geographical <laughs> definition of the tropics. In terms of uh, what's happening in the upper atmosphere, this is really crucial to understanding what's happening in the tropics. Um, so if we look at the diagram here, we have the equator. So obviously most of the sun's energy is hitting the equator and that creates a lot of evapotranspiration. So we have uh, hot moist air rising from the, uh, the surface of the planet along the equator. Um, as it rises, it cools, the, uh, the moisture precipitates, which is why we get such heavy rainfall year round on the equator. We've now got some hot um, dry air circulating the upper atmosphere, it cools. Um, so we now have the cooler dry air falling around 30 degrees north and south uh, because it's very dry area, dry air. This is where we get the deserts of the world. So we get the great deserts of the Sahara um, in Northern hemisphere of Africa, uh, the Kalahari and, and Namib in the uh, Southern hemisphere of Africa. And then of course, if we went round, we'd have Arizona um, in the Northern hemisphere, or if we went along the Southern hemisphere, we'd, we'd have the Atacama and the Australian desert. So, um, so this area here between the deserts and the equator is uh, the area that I would define for tropical agriculture. So we have the high rainfall areas here on the equator, um, declining rainfall as we move north until we get to the deserts with uh, zero rainfall. Uh, not only have we got cold, cold, uh, so dry air sinking into the deserts, that air also pushes any moisture away from the deserts. So. As we go north or south of the equator, I mean, on the equator, it's raining pretty much every day of the year. But as we move north and south, we get into distinct rainfall patterns. Um, this is a diagram from a very old agriculture textbook, but it's still one of the best diagrams I've ever seen for trying to understand rainfall in the tropics. So um, the hatched area is the rainy seasons. So along the equator, we have um, an area where we have pretty much rainfall throughout the year. Um, if I can change my pointer. Okay, um, so as we move to about five degrees north or south, we get into two rainy seasons a year. So this are the bimodal um, rains areas. Um, as you continue moving north or south, those two rainy seasons, they usually be a long and a short rains, will start to merge into one rainy season. Uh, and then obviously if you continued off the diagram into the deserts, you get no rainy season. So it looks like a, an A, capital A. So um, the length of course of the rainy seasons will define which crops you can grow in the rainy season. Um, so as many countries will have a, a long and a short, you'll be growing different crops in different rainy seasons. One of the challenges we have with climate change, we know that rainfall may in some countries will decline, in others it will increase, and the temperatures will increase. But it's trying to understand when we've got a, a trend due to climate change or when we're actually getting more of a pattern of um, variability. So this is the diagram that uh, the UN Environmental Programme produced for Darfur. Uh, they were using this to illustrate how the rainfall is declining for Darfur, which is uh, in, uh, in Sudan. Um, when I looked at this, I found something I thought was uh, even more interesting with declining rainfall, and that was uh, a change in cycles of rainfall variability. And um, so what I think you can see on this is um, an area here, sort of pre-1955, uh, when you had extremely high variability in rainfall, and then sort of around the sort of mid-1950s, it went into a period of relatively stable rainfall. We now seem to be moving into a period of uh, variability again. Of course, um, this change between a period of very high rainfall variability and somewhat stable rainfall happened at independence. So you'd have to wonder whether the agriculture and livestock policies which were developed at independence are still appropriate for this period we seem to be moving into of a highly um, highly variable rainfall. So I think this is, you know, diagrams like this can actually show a lot more than just declining in rainfall. Okay, so climate change, we expect the temperature to rise in most of the countries in Africa. Of course, crops have their optimum 
temperature ranges and then a threshold uh, of the maximum and minimum temperatures they can survive. So the optimum temperatures will change across the growing season. So this is uh, an example for maize where um, really the, the sensitive period is in the tasseling period. So anything above 30 degrees at, at the tasseling period, and you're going to see a dramatic decline in potential maize yields. So across Africa, smallholder maize yields struggle to reach one ton of maize per hectare. But you know, with good agricultural practice, with good support, um, I work with small holders who managed to get five tons and the record is eight tons per hectare of maize. So you can produce good good yields under small holder agriculture, but once the temperature gets above 30 degrees, which is which is expected to do for most of southern Africa, you'll never you'll never reach those kind of yields. So you are really limited. Um, one of the things we can try to think about is if we can understand rainfall patterns we could try to tie the planting of our maize so that we fit the tasseling with a cooler part of the year so the, the maize won't be putting on tassels in the in the hottest period of the year. Um, it's important to note that for many crops it's not so much the daytime temperatures which are critical it's the night so for example for wheat and um, Irish potatoes, salana potatoes, we can grow those in some very hot areas, you know, it's uh, their staple crops in the Middle East, because if you grow them in the desert, it may be very hot in the day, but it's cool at night. So you can grow them in very hot areas under irrigation as long as the nights are cool. Uh, and one of the things that's tended to be missing from the uh, debate on climate change is what's happening to the temperatures at night. Obviously, we have similar issues for water availability. So in areas where rainfall is expected to decline, this will also have an impact on crop production. Um, so here's a, a chart of water requirements for maize. Obviously, very high water requirements if you're in the semi-arid tropics, uh, much lower water requirements if you're in the humid areas. Um, and again, obviously mid-season is when maize has its highest water requirements. Um, so can you adjust your planting pattern to avoid um, having a... <coughs> the maize reaching its uh, mid-season growth in a dry period or as rainfall declines. So a lot easier to do for, for commercial farmers. Um, so you'll find commercial farmers, say in, uh, in Zambia, will be planting their maize under irrigation in the dry season. And when the, the rainy season starts, they can switch off the irrigation. So, you know, their plants have reached mid-season as the rains are really getting underway. That's not, not much of an option for smallholder farmers. If we if we combine temperatures and rainfall, then we get the growing season. So here's an example for Mabruka, which is more or less in the middle of Sierra Leone. There's one rainy season a year, and obviously it's a, it's a wet country, it's a long rainy season. So we can see from this chart, although the rains will begin in the, uh, the first week of April, um, the top line here is the rainfall, and then this line here is evapotranspiration. So although rain begins the first week, second week of April, um, rain you are, you're only going to have sufficient water for crop production once the, the rainfall exceeds evapor evaporation. So really crop growth only really end, starts at the end of April as rainfall exceeds evapotranspiration, and then crop growth will end the you know, third week of November once uh, rainfall falls below evapotranspiration. As we heat up the planet, of course, this line here for evapotranspiration will start to move upwards. Uh, as it moves upwards, that will reduce the blue period, the growing period. So that means we have to think about uh, the cr what crops we, we, we grow and which varieties we plant. Obviously, this is uh, a wet country. I could have used a graph for a, a drier area. Um, but one of the responses as NGOs has been to plant faster maturing, for example, maize varieties. Um, and a lot of work has gone into breeding quick maturing maize varieties um, in order to fit in with a shrinking growing season. The challenge with this, of course, is that uh, the longer a crop is in the field, the more it can photosynthesize and uh, therefore the more carbohydrates it can produce. So um, a quick maturing variety will never produce as much grain as a, a late maturing variety. As we, we heat up the, the surface of the earth, we're going to see a loss in soil fertility. Um, obviously, we'll evaporate more 
soil moisture. Uh, we're going to increase the rate of decomposition of organic matter in the soil and uh, the oxidation of nutrients within the soil. And we risk entering a negative feedback loop. So as the uh, soil organic matter oxidizes and that's putting CO2 into the atmosphere, that's again warming up the atmosphere, resulting in more CO2 being released from the soil. It's a similar issue for nitrates in the soil. So nitrous oxides um, being released into the atmosphere. And of course, nitrous oxides are a much more powerful greenhouse gas than CO2. So we risk a, a negative feedback loop. And we're also seeing a loss in the, uh, the beneficial soil organisms. So these are the, the macro fauna and flora, the earthworms and more the termites in the tropics, as well as the bacteria in the soil, the fungi in the soil, the mycorrhiza, which transfer nutrients from the soil into plants, the, uh, the bacteria which, which fix nitrogen from the atmosphere. Um, an increase in temperatures is going to speed up the metabolism of insects. Um, and a very good example of this is uh, the foil armyworm. Um, we don't have it in Ireland, but I predict we will have it in Ireland at, inevitably at some stage. Um, this is a pest from the Americas. Um, it's, it occurs year round in Central America and then it expands from Central America right up to Canada um, in the summer months. Um, in Central America, it has a one month life cycle. Um, if you go into sort of the Great Plains of America, it's a two month life cycle because it's cooler. So as we speed up, as we warm up uh, the atmosphere, we'll be speeding up insect reproduction rates. So the fall armyworm arrived in Africa in 2016 and it spread like a plague from, from the Bible across Africa. It's, uh, you know, it looks really dramatic when it enters a maize field and uh, it eats pretty much everything. Um, Obviously, as we know, in Ireland, any changes in rainfall will favour fungal diseases. Um, and we're also going to see changes in vector behaviour. And the, the main vectors for viral diseases in crop plants are the aphids and white flies. Livestock uh, will also be affected. So particularly for livestock, we're looking at heat stress, which is the balance between heat dissipation and heat production. So every livestock variety has its comfort zone, um, which is about 25 degrees for Frisian Holsteins. Once you go over the comfort zone, and for most, uh, most cattle it's about 30 degrees, um, you st they start to reduce their feed intake, which of course reduces the amount of uh, meat they produce and milk they produce. Um, each livestock breed will have a different response curve to increase temperatures. Um, Obviously, the, uh, the traditional livestock breeds for the Sahel will be highly tolerant. And if you look at uh, a livestock breed from the Sahel, uh, you know, from the, uh, the, the semi-desert areas, they tend to be quite scrawny, um, but that means they have a good surface to volume ratio. So they're quite good at dissipating the heat they produce through metabolism. One of the concerns we have is uh, there's been a lot of uh, enthusiastic crossbreeding of traditional breeds with Frisian Holsteins in order to increase the milk production. Uh, yes, this has increased uh, the milk production, but Frisian Holsteins are not very uh, heat tolerant. So we do have the major concerns as to how um, these crossbreeds will respond to increasing temperatures. And of course, um, you know, crossbred. Frisian Holsteins will require large quantities of water, which may not be so easy to, to uh, provide. We also need to think about fodder production, um, where you're grazing your animals on rangeland. Um, we're going to see a change in the, uh, the species of the rangelands and the digestibility of these species. Obviously, increasing CO2 levels. CO2 is a fertilizer, so that will increase the, the growth rates of some plants, but these will tend to be more of the weedy species, so not necessarily the plants which we want our animals to graze on. And as for crops, we'll see a change in the distribution of livestock <laughs> diseases, particularly the vector borne uh, uh, pathogens. Um, of, of which the main vector across the world and particularly in the tropics are ticks, um, diseases like East Coast fever, corridor disease, uh, babesiosis, anaplasmosis, are all spread by ticks. We have mosquitoes which spread Rift Valley fever, which is a, a zoonotic disease which can spread into humans as well. Um, 
one of the things that I am working with Queen's University Belfast at the moment is looking at gastrointestinal nematodes in goats. Um, obviously, we know that the nematode levels increase in the rainy season. Um, so we're, we're doing modeling with Queens on um, how nematode populations will change with rainfall and if we can develop an app to help warn, warn farmers when the high risk periods are. We're also looking at how to move away from the, the blanket treatment of, of goats. So the tra traditional advice is to, uh, to, to deworm your, your herds and your, your flocks in the rainy season um, and moving away to a test and selective treatment approach when you only treat those animals which are really showing severe symptoms of gastrointestinal nematode infections uh, in order to try and reduce resistance to the, uh, <coughs> to the dewormers currently on the market. And even in Europe, I mean, we see an issue if you consider um, wild boar to be a vector for African swine fever. This is a, a viral disease that, uh, that jumped from uh, warthogs in Africa into pigs in Africa, moved through the Middle East. It's now in uh, mainland Europe. It's spreading very fast because of the mild winter is in, in Europe. <laughs> Do not bore surviving the mild winters boar populations have gone crazy. So there's a lot more wild boar carrying African swine fever. Um, increasing CO2 will actually fertilize crops. Um, some crops will be in a better position to take advantage of this. Uh, so potatoes, we know from research that uh, Chagas has conducted that uh, increasing CO2 increases the number and weight of potato tubers. Um, we're going to see longer growing seasons in the higher latitudes and altitudes. So the real highlands of Ethiopia are sort of 3,000 to 4,000 meters high. Uh, they're very cold at the moment. All we can grow is oats and Irish potatoes there, um, but potentially you'll be able to grow a much wider range of crops. And in uh, some areas you'll have a reduced risk of frost. Um, we do have frost in some unusual areas in uh, Africa, in the western province of Zambia, which is actually one of the hottest and driest parts of Zambia. It will experience frosts. So we'll see a re reduction in frost risks. And something as uh, an NGO like uh, South South Africa, we're very, um, we do a lot of work on the, the links between agriculture and nutrition. Um, you know, it seems sort of uh, stating the obvious that we are what we eat, but actually uh, it's very complicated. So trying to understand um, how agriculture impacts on nutrition, particularly the nutrition for children um, is, is, is very complicated, but we are learning slowly. Um, so a recent uh, research report that came out at the beginning of the year um, predicted that higher long-term temperatures are found to cause a significant drop in child nutrition, and particularly this is for long-term, which is uh, chronic malnutrition rather than acute malnutrition. Um, and looking through the literature, <coughs> it was um, quite a lot of concerns as to how climate change will impact on the nutritional content of crops. So uh, low levels of micronutrient intake is one of the drivers for chronic malnutrition in the kids. Um, and particularly things like zinc, um, which, which is very important for young children. Uh, if young children are deficient in zinc, then they're more likely to get to incidence of diarrhea, which clearly you know, knocks back the growth. Um, and iron, which is obviously uh, very high levels of anemia in women across Africa and Asia. So the last thing we want to do is to see a decline in iron content of crops. So the research at the moment seems to indicate that um, it's really the C3 plants um, which will suffer most. So an increase in CO2 levels, it will stimulate an increase in photosynthesis and carbohydrate production in cereals, but only if there's sufficient phosphorus in the soil and most tropical soils are highly deficient in phosphorus. Um, and then we see an increase in CO2 levels, um, decreasing the levels of zinc and iron and proteins in the C3 grains and in legumes. So, you know, these are causes for concern, but it's still limited research on this at the moment. How can we respond to the, uh, the changes in climate? Well, FAO in Rome has uh, come up with an approach they're call, calling climate smart agriculture. Uh, they define four pillars of climate, sorry, three pillars of climate smart agriculture. First is uh, ensuring we can sustainably increase agricultural productivity and incomes. 
Secondly, that we're adapting and building resistance to climate change. And thirdly, we're reducing or removing greenhouse gas emissions where possible. FAO has a, it was a 500 page book called the CSA source book. It, the new edition is now 600 pages. So plenty of information in there if you want to read up about it. Um, the kind of activities, uh, projects or technologies that uh, SHA will be promoting uh, range from agroforestry, uh, as I mentioned earlier, quick maturing drought avoiding varieties, soil and water conservation, uh, working at the landscape level um, on things like rangeland management, fruit to fuel efficient stoves and uh, livestock and crop insurance. I'd like to give you a couple of examples here from our work. So this is a, a photograph from Zambia. Um, this is a, a maize crop underneath trees. Um, those of you, uh, hopefully it's a, a, it's a good quality photograph on your screens and you'll see you've got a, a lovely uh, lush maize crop here underneath the tree canopy, which uh, will strike most of you as being odd. Um, but if you look closely at the trees, you'll see there's no leaves on the trees. So this is a very unusual tree. It's, uh, it's called Fade Herbia, Alphidia. And uh, whereas most trees put their leaves on in the uh, wet season and lose their leaves in the dry season, Fade Herbia has a reverse phenology. So it has no leaves in the wet season and it puts its leaves on the dry season. Now it produces large quantities of nitrogen. It's a nitrogen fixing tree. And it's fantastic for intercropping with crops because it's not shading your crop, it's not competing for water with your crop. And the, the leaf litter is producing significant amounts of nitrogen. So in Zambia, research trials have shown that under you know, a, a, a plot like this with maize growing under fade herbia, you're getting uh, extra three tons of maize. Sorry, an extra one ton of maize under the fade herbia. With, uh, so three tons under fade herbia to two tons outside the canopy and uh, similar trials in Senegal on pearl millet found a uh, 2.5 times higher yield under fade herbia than outside. So agroforestry is one option. We can intercrop trees with, um, with crops like maize. Water, of course, if we're going to see an increase in surface temperatures and a possible reduction in rainfall, clearly we need to get more crop per drop of water. How can we do this? An obvious one is, is for drip irrigation through high, high efficiency irrigation approaches. Drip irrigation is an obvious one. It's uh, one of those save the world technologies, but it's proving to be very complicated in Africa. So drip irrigation is used in the horticulture industry everywhere in the world. Um, it's used by smallholder farmers in Asia. Here you can see a farmer in India. Um, but it really hasn't taken off amongst smallholder farmers in Africa. Um, and it's a very, you know, it's a, it's a puzzling question. I don't have the answer to this one, but I have visited many uh, agricultural extension officers across Africa. I visited NGO officers and looked behind the office to find stacks of unused drip irrigation pipe. So it should work, it does work, but uptake has been very low. More successful has been these simple pumps. Um, just simple treadle pumps in the upper two photographs or here this is from uh, from Zimbabwe this is a simple water pump to extract water from uh, the bed of a river during the dry season made from a couple of bits of plastic pipe a piece of reinforcing a bar and a wooden plunger so this is all made locally uh, Really nice example of uh, high efficiency irrigation from Pakistan. So this, uh, this photograph was taken uh, on the edge of the Thar Desert. Um, these are sand dunes and that crop you can see growing on it are chickpeas. So you can imagine trying to irrigate chickpeas on sand dunes is technically challenging. And uh, the solution is to use rain guns. So these can be really effective. You don't need a level field. You don't need to lay out your drip pipes. You can bring this in every night if you're worried about theft. Um, so, you know, work in uh, South Punjab, you know, we've got really good results for you from using rain guns um, for wheat and uh, chickpeas. Another simple should be a, a no brainer is to actually line your irrigation canals. So here we can see this is also in South, South Punjab in Pakistan. 
you see most irrigation canals are just uh, trenches in, in this case, just in sand. So it's not surprising that most of the water leaks out. Um, if you can line it with concrete, clearly you can save a lot of water, but that's expensive. Uh, and I've often thought about uh, if we could design basically the, the, the material we use for pond liners in Ireland, if we could make a simple canal liner out of the same material, but you could simply roll, roll along your canal, your irrigation canal. Um, another nice example, this is in Burundi, which is catching the water that runs off the roads. Um, this was a win-win. The, the road engineers were very happy with this because if you manage the water coming off the roads, you uh, save your roads from being washed away in the rains. So uh, the water from the road would uh, enter a settling tank to sediment out the uh, <coughs> mud from the road and then into a rainwater catchment pond, which could then into flow into irrigation canals, in this case for irrigating the banana crops. Uh, although most of the Great Lakes area is high rainfall, this part of Burundi, for some reason which I don't understand, is remarkably dry. Um, conservation agriculture is another way we can uh, conserve soil moisture, um, but we can also use it to reduce erosion. Here's a couple of photographs I took on a farm we were working on in North Korea. Um, this wasn't with South South Africa, this was with Concern Worldwide. I tried to match up two photographs, not perfectly. This is the upper field and the lower field. The upper field was on, on, on under no-till agriculture. You can see an erosion gully flowing between the two fields, but you can see in the CA field uh, that erosion gully is starting to fill in and recover, whereas under conventional agriculture, you can see the stones in the gully, so the, the gully is still being eroded. Um, in North Korea, we set up these uh, these plots to actually test different uh, uh, tillage practices um, to see what effect they had on erosion. Uh, you can see we, we put a, a trench here to collect the sediment and the water. We found in this case in North Korea that maize under normal tillage we were losing 8.7 tons of soil a year, whereas under conservation agriculture we saved one ton of soil per year. <coughs> Another thing we can look at is the crop and variety diversity on the farm. So uh, farmers can grow a variety of crops and a variety of varieties in order to hedge against climate risk. Uh, this many farmers have been doing for centuries. So traditionally in South Sudan, uh, farmers will grow, you know, five to seven different sorghum varieties in their fields. So they'll have an early maturing variety. So if the rains end early, they'll get a harvest from the early maturing one. They'll have a second early, uh, a main crop and a late maturing sorghum variety. So if the rains are good, they get all the benefits of the late maturing variety. Um, in Liberia, you'll find farmers planting five to seven varieties of rice. Um, in uh, Niger, which is obviously a very dry country, farmers will mix sorghum and pearl millet. Um, and actually mix the seed and plant both at the same time. It pearl millet is extremely drought tolerant. Sorghum is fairly drought tolerant. So if you get a reasonable rainy season, you'll get a, a good harvest of sorghum. Whereas if it's very dry, the, at least you get something from the pearl millet. Um, you'll often find many smallholder farmers will have their fields scattered across the landscape. A lot of this is due to land fragmentation, but it's also a way to, to hedge against your risks. Um, so you may have some, some fields in the, uh, in, in the river valleys, which can be irrigated as well as uh, fields on the hillsides and the, uh, the highlands. Um, so clearly, if we can uh, increase the crop diversity, it's a way of ensuring farmers against uh, climatic risks. But we are up against a problem that uh, once small hold, once land holdings get very small, farmers will really struggle to produce enough carbohydrates from their plot, and they're really unable to allocate, you know, parts of their plot to other crops. And this is something that uh, becomes a real issue because farmers are unable to rotate their crops. They have to grow maize, 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 uh, season after season just to produce the carbohydrates, uh, which has other impacts, particularly for, you know, for weeds and, and pests that build up in the, in the fields. For livestock, um, I mentioned the issue of uh, crossbreeding uh, cattle with Friesian Holsteins. Um, very difficult to see. Uh, you know, go across Africa, it's very rare to find a, a herd of cattle which doesn't show some signs of a, a bit of Frisian Holstein in, in them. 
Um, but we do have livestock, traditional livestock, which are very resistant to climate change. Uh, the caracal sheep, which actually originates in Afghanistan, um, has become is the main uh, sheep variety in uh, in Namibia. And then the red Maasai sheep from Kenya. Uh, the red Maasai sheep are uh, very uh, you know, a very interesting variety. Um, as you can see, they have a very short coat, which means obviously they don't overheat, uh, and also it helps to reduce the vector parasites. Um, and they're remarkably resistant to homunculus, um, gastrointestinal nematode. Um, but you can see, if you look at the, uh, the tail, it's a very fat tail. So this is a, a breed of sheep that stores all its fat in the tail. So although they're extremely hardy, but will grow in, they need very little water. Um, the market doesn't like them. The Kenyan market has moved towards a more marbled meat. So we want uh, sheep meat with the, the fat mixed in with a protein. So, you know, it's, Clearly, the red Maasai sheep would be a great solution to climate change, but market market pressures make it. Uh, you know, it's it's not as simple as uh, as we would like to think as agronomists. We have to think about the markets. Uh, similarly, we are seeing herders in Kenya moving toward, toward from cows to camels and from goats to sheep. Um, in fact, the camel production in Kenya has gone through the roof, and Kenya is now the world's third largest camel producer. But it's not without risks. Uh, most of you will have heard of MERS, which is the Middle East Respiratory Virus, um, which is uh, transmitted from camels. So obviously public health authorities in Kenya are now extremely, extremely worried about the MERS risk from the uh, increasing camel population in Kenya. So moving on to conservation agriculture, something I've uh, done a lot of work on in the tropics over the last uh, 10 years. So no, it's called no-till uh, in many countries. Three basic principles, avoid disturbing the soil. Um, so this obviously reduces the, the erosion, the water erosion, the wind erosion. Um, you can do this using rippers, direct cedars, or, or by hand through jab planters and xi holes. Uh, keeping the, the soil covered to reduce evapotranspiration and evaporation from the soil surface using mulches or cover crops. And then just general good agricultural practice, rotate the crops. So in the conservation agriculture projects I've been working on in uh, Southern Africa, in Malawi, we'll be rotating the maize with uh, a groundnuts, which is a cash crop. It's also a nutrition crop and a nitrogen fixer with soya, also obviously a nitrogen fixer, but a very good alternative cash crop to tobacco, tobacco being the, the main cash crop in Malawi, but it's, uh, it's declining and uh, even the big tobacco companies are starting to move out of tobacco. In Zambia, also rotating maize with groundnuts, but also Jabambara nut, which looks like a groundnut, it's actually a completely, completely different species, but it's a very hardy variety. Um, cowpeas, cowpeas are produced across Africa. This is an amazing crop. Um, you can eat every part of the cowpea, so you can use the leaves as a, as a vegetable, the flowers as a vegetable, you can eat the pods green, you can eat the, obviously the cowpeas when they're dried. And I've even met women in Zambia who, who use the roots for flavoring drinks. And in Zambia using sunflowers as a cash crop in the rotation. And Zimbabwe uh, rotating between maize, cowpeas and sorghum in the, in the low belt, which is the, the dry areas of Zimbabwe. So in terms of uh, not disturbing the soil, so how to plant without disturbing the soil, um, I'm sure, obviously I'm, I don't need to talk about mechanized agriculture to you. You all know more about mechanized agriculture than I do. So I've moved straight on to sort of ox drawn and, and hand operations. So here's a, a simple ox drawn ripper. You can make, you can convert a traditional ox plow into a ripper. You simply remove the mole board, you put two wings on to stabilize it and a ripper tine. Really, really fast. Uh, you basically have to run to keep up with the oxen. So you can uh, prepare your fields very fast, uh, which reduces the cost. And of course, uh, the problem you have with animal traction in the tro tropics is at the end of a dry season, your oxen are very weak because they, you know, they haven't had a lot of high quality feed. Uh, and so they do struggle to plow and plowing takes a long time with oxen. Whereas with a ripper, the energy requirements are a fraction of the requirements of more mobile plow. So even with weak oxen, you can prepare your land. 
world. Um, the Brazilians have really led the way in terms of producing equipment for um, smallholder conservation agriculture. So this is a Fitterelli planter from Brazil. This is an Oxdrawn planter. You have a, a, a knife blade in front, which will cut the trash, um, a ripper time to open up the furrow, fertilizer and seed here. And then this wheel will drive the mechanism to uh, for, for the uh, seed and the fertilizer bins. This is the NAPIC, also from Brazil. This is kind of the, uh, the Ferrari of Oxdrawn uh, direct seeders. In order to reduce the import costs, uh, this is a Magoya planter and ripper developed in Zambia. It's a similar idea, but all made from locally available metal to keep the cost down to the sort of $100 a ripper mark, which is really the price point for Zambia. Yeah. Um, if you don't have oxen, and of course a lot of farmers won't have oxen for various reasons, um, here's a, a hand seeder, the jab planter. Again, the best stuff all comes from Brazil. So this is the Fitterelli jab planter. Um, it works like a pair of scissors. You open and close it with the fertilizer in one side, seed in the other. Um, again, like everything in this uh, in the world, the Chinese have cottoned on to the idea and have now taken the Fitterelli idea and converted it. Uh, so these are... A Chinese jab plant has been used in North Korea. And uh, this is from Professor Lee in China. He looked at the, the traditional hoe used in Africa and he's developed a tool that looks uh, very similar to the traditional African hoe. You use it in the same manner, but every time you bring the hoe down into the soil, there's a click and uh, you have a sack here with your seed and fertilizer, one time for the uh, fertilizer, one, one time for the seed. So farmers can use the same sort of muscles they've been using with the hoe in order to use the lice seeder. Well, we have about uh, two minutes left for the presentation. Right. Great, so I'll just do the, the last one um, and then we'll go on to questions. So, and finally, this is a technology that came from uh, Burkina Faso and uh, Niger, which is the Zai Basin. So these are little, just little scrapes, they're only 15 centimeter deep. So you can prepare these in the dry season. Um, and then when the rains come, you're ready to go. So you can put your fertilizer, your compost and your seed in the basins and the first rains. Um, and then you're ready to go. And this means you're planting early and means your chance has a, your crop has a much greater chance of maturing in case the rains end early. So uh, these are examples from Zimbabwe and here's, here's a group of ladies who are helping an old lady who is uh, no longer able to prepare her own Zai Basin. So they very fast, this was a 50 by 50 meter plot and they prepared this plot in about an hour. So, um, I'm happy to stop there and to take questions from the audience. Okay, that's great, uh, Paul. Thank you very much. Uh, fascinating uh, presentation. Really great insight into to the work that you're doing in Africa and and in other other in parts of Asia as well. Um, obviously, there's there's a, a lot of things you talked about there that have have relevance to Ireland. Um, mm -hmm. But I mean. In terms of contrasting the two systems of, of uh, European agriculture and uh, agriculture in, in, in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, you know, what, what do you think are the key lessons or, or issues that we need to be conscious of here at, within Europe, uh, you know, in terms of adaptation and, and preparing for uh, the likely changes in our climate? Uh, um... And I guess we will also have to think about the impacts of increasing CO2 levels on our crops. You know, how is that going to change the nutrient levels in our crops, whether it's for animal feeds and for, uh, or for human consumption. Uh, so certainly that's a factor. And uh, the, the little research that I've seen that has been done on CO2 levels, for example, in maize, has focused on maize as animal fodder rather than humans. <laughs> Certainly the CO2 levels uh, will have an impact on the nutritional value of our own crops. Yeah, because you, you showed a very interesting slide there with the, um, oh. the uh, fed herbia tree there and fixing yeah. nitrogen. Um, you know, we, we're, we're living in Ireland, so there's a huge uh, emphasis on reducing uh, nitrogen uh, with, within agriculture across yeah. Europe. 
And, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of lessons that can be learned there from mm -hmm. the development work that's going on there. I, I, look, I, 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 I don't want to sound self-serving mm. here from a, a European perspective, because, of course, a lot of the, the emphasis here is on what we can do to support mm -hmm. uh, the work uh, that, that's happening in, in, uh, in, in Africa through Self-Help uh, Africa. Um, I mean, just in terms of the key priorities for Self-Help Africa, I mean, a lot of people looking on today will be looking at, well, you know, what, what, what can we do in Ireland or what can the Irish agri-food sector do to support the efforts of Self-Help Africa? You know, what, what, what are the, the, the key challenges there from your perspective that you, you feel that there could be maybe better engagement? Well, I mean, obviously we have the corporate social responsibility um, angle of it and also when we have the technology transfer so uh, technology transfer yet yeah, clearly there there's a lot of uh, very interesting technological developments in Irish agriculture and um, we've been working with Chagas uh, to try and take some of the the research and the technology from Ireland to Africa so for Chagas working with Chagas we have um, a joint the dairy project in Kenya, which is working with the uh, linking Chagas and the Kenyan Agriculture uh, Research Institute to um, basically take the learning from the uh, economic breeding index that's been developed for the dairy cattle in Ireland and applying that to Kenya. Um, again, with uh, Chagas and Sustainable Food Systems Ireland, we're now doing a consultancy for the Irish Embassy in Uganda, which will again be looking at how we can link Irish institutions with Ugandan institutions to share uh, learning and technology. Um, and again, we have a similar project in Eritrea. Um, so that's on the technology transfer. In terms of uh, sort of uh, the corporate social responsibility, uh, I'd like to plug our uh, link with. Klinisk. Um, we have a great project going with the Glenisk. So um, you can either go onto the Glenisk website or to the Self Help Africa website. So with Glenisk, we're planting trees in Ireland and Africa. So if you pledge, uh, you know, five euros on the Glenisk site, that will help to plant at one tree in Ireland for, for every ten trees we plant in Africa. And if you buy Glenisk yogurt, and I hope I'm allowed to do commercial <laughs> promotions on this video. Um, so for each pot of Glenisk yogurt you buy, that'll, that'll donate uh, 50 cents towards tree planting in Africa. So uh, we're looking, obviously, planting trees to try and uh, absorb the CO2 we're producing around the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are talking to, our, to other corporates in, in Ireland about uh, expanding the tree planting program. Yeah, I encourage anyone to, to have a look at a self-help Africa uh, web page because I also see that you're doing a, a 40 day uh, walk as well for, for Lent uh, that people mm -hmm. can raise some funds as well that yeah. way. So uh, that's, a, that's a really excellent idea for people who are in lockdown and uh, want to, to get some exercise in within their 5k radius, of course. Mm -hmm. Um, Pat, some, some, some interesting questions coming there uh, from, from all different perspectives. Yeah, uh, some very, very questions. I, I suppose one a common theme uh, in some of the early questions, how do you define smallholder uh, agriculture, or, or not so much define, but describe smallholder agriculture? What's, what's, what's a smallholder? Well, it'll depend on which uh, agroecological zone you're in. So, um, but typically we're talking of somebody who has really less than two hectares of land. Although in somewhere like Malawi, you know, if you have a half a hectare of land, you're the richest farmer in the village. So it is very small land holdings, um, um, not, uh, not mechanized. Um, so for example, for Southern Africa, we tend to define smallholders, emerging farmers and commercial farms. So the commercial farms will be the sort of 5,000 5, hectare, you know, fully mechanized farms. The emerging farms would be the farmers of the sort of the, the five hectare who who can invest money in mechanization and new seeds and the small holders as the less, you know, the two hectares and less. A, que a question there in relation to the records. Uh, are there any good long term records over the past century to actually show the impacts of, of, of climate change on, on, on weather in Africa? A very good question. It is challenging. Um, obviously, formal records only began with the colonial period. 
So, for example, for Kenya, you know, during the colonial period, we do have good rainfall records. Um, so for Kenya, it, it's good. Uh, Uganda, we have a big gap in the records during the sort of the Idi Amin period, when people had more important things to worry about than measuring rainfall. Um, and of course, in other countries, we have very little in the way of rainfall records. Um, but we do have an interesting project with UCD. We have a, a post postdoc student who is examining um, stalagmites and stalactites from caves in southern Africa. He's doing isotopic analysis of them to try and understand rainfall patterns in southern Africa, sort of pre, pre, pre paper records. There's a, 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 quite a few questions around a kind of the sustainable development goals uh, around uh, gender equality. How mm -hmm. are the, those various themes that come from, I suppose, the, the SDGs uh, 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 embedded in your programs? Gender equality is hugely important. Again, we could do a whole, a whole web, webinar on this one. Um, very many factors. It's you know what um, what what's the differences between men and women's role in agriculture. So women will traditionally be um, you know doing things like the weeding, um, the planting. Men will often um, prepare the fields. Now, for example, if there are oxen involved or mechanisation, then preparing the field will be a man's job. If it's handwork, it could be a woman's job. So. If you can mechanize agriculture using, say, small tractors, the, the sort of monoaxial tractors, possibly that will reduce women's workload because preparing the fields or doing mechanized weeding will now become the man's job. Um, we have differences in crops. So um, groundnuts, peanuts in much of Africa will be the, the woman's crop. Maize will be the man's crop. Um, we do have the concern that if you know, groundnuts becomes commercially interesting, Will men take over women's responsibilities for this? Um, for the dairy sector, although men will generally traditionally own the animals, um, pretty much every country, women control the milk. You know, they milk the cows, they process the milk, they sell the milk. Um, so we have to be very careful when we're doing dairy projects that we don't take control of the milk value chain away from the women. We also need to look at things like inheritance uh, or cross. Uh, most of Africa, it's um, the patrilineal inheritance, so it goes from a man to his sons, but we do have areas in Africa where it's matrilineal, so it goes from the, the land is inherited by the daughters, which doesn't necessarily mean women are in a, a better position, because their husbands feel, well, if I ever get divorced, I lose everything, so I'm not particularly enthusiastic about investing in the land. Yeah, so like it's, co it's complicated. <laughs> yes. uh, that translates uh, across the world, I think. Yes. Uh, Paul, a few questions coming in in relation yeah. to the appropriateness of sending uh, Holstein Frisian animals uh, to uh, these, these parts of the world. Um, in light of what you've talked about there, uh, the, 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 uh, the, how, how, how the climate, how, how um, suitable is the climate for, for that type of an animal? Well, the highland areas were suitable, um, but one of the challenges, as I mentioned in my slide, is, you know, say the highlands for Kenya, highlands of Ethiopia were tick free, for example. Um, we're seeing ticks moving up into these highland areas, and that's obviously very challenging for Frisian Holsteins, which have very low resistance to tick-borne diseases. And as I mentioned, the heat stress issue. Um, most, you know, we, most farmers would actually be crossing using AI, um, but I still have some concerns over, you know, crossing with Holstein Frisians. And this is why things like the research we're doing with Chattrakas uh, in Kenya about the economic breeding index is looking at um, different crosses and the economic values of diff different crosses. And again, as uh, Pat mentioned, the gender issue, um, you know, talk to the women, what traits are the women looking for? They're the ones who have to milk the animals. And uh, when I've done uh, this kind of survey in Ethiopia, not surprisingly, women actually said we're actually more interested in Jersey crosses because the, the women have to carry the fodder to the animals, the women have to carry the water to the animals, and the women have to milk them. So yes. they were much more enthusiastic about a, a docile animal that didn't try to kick them and didn't need as much water and fodder. Of course, yes. That again, an interesting one for Ethiopia um, during the far 
for fasting periods, people can't consume uh, animal products. Um, so Jersey milk, high cream content could be turned into to butter, but could be then stored until the end of the fasting period. Okay, so really, really practical issues there. Uh, we have a question here. Uh, it says, Paul, in the future, do you think agriculture will prosper more in some countries or regions if climate continues to change? Or if so, are or will po some populations start to move in response to, to those changes? Well, depending on which uh, academic you read, uh, that's already happening. Um, many academics will talk about uh, sort of climate refugees and climate, uh, you know, wars, conflicts due to climate. Um, I actually find it, it's a very complicated thing and it's, you know, tendency to oversimplify. Um, we do have examples, for example, um, in Kenya, um, areas of Maasai land where actually the rainfall is predicted to increase. Um, and there we could see uh, rangelands being converted to maize production, which uh, may or may not be a good thing. It could lead to you know, more conflicts between herders and farmers. Um, what we are seeing um, is really the middle classes investing in agriculture. And this is a trend across Africa. Middle classes living in the cities with, with salaries are investing in land back home because they have that, that capital to invest, but also very much because they're linked into the information economy. They're the ones who can surf the internet and learn about what Chagas is doing in Ireland and think about, well, can I apply this to Zambia? So um, we are seeing uh, changes, particularly in Zambia and Kenya, of, uh, you know, it's the middle classes who are tending to invest in agriculture in, in rural areas. A couple of questions there. Uh, are there problems with, with seed availability and, uh, and distribution? Absolutely. Um, that's one of the big areas for self up Africa. Um, we, uh, as an NGO, we are looking at, we would promote a pluralistic seed system. Um, so obviously you have the big seed companies, but we're working a lot with uh, farmers, uh, with particularly for cooperatives, which are producing seed. So we have very large uh, seed producing cooperatives, which have uh, come together to form cooperative unions in Ethiopia. Uh, you know, we are talking, which now supply a significant uh, part of the seed sector in Ethiopia. So uh, through cropped in Ethiopia, we are producing a lot of the seed that's required on the Ethiopian market. Um, similar projects in Zambia, though, through sort of farmer owned enterprises rather than through the cooperative system. Um, but the challenge is, um, and it's not just, you know, small, you know, the work we're doing, it's a challenge for everybody, is the early generation seed. It's getting enough seed from the researchers, from the breeders, to then multiply on the seed farms. And uh, that's really the challenge is how do you boost the production of early generation seed in order for the seed producers to satisfy market demand? The question here, and it, it kind of, uh, I suppose, opens up a bigger uh, discussion in terms of approach. Are you are you looking for people to work on projects? But I think it, it alludes to the, the question of the approach of, of enabling the systems and, and the people within the, the countries to be their own development agents. And I think that's uh, part of the approach of South Help Africa. It is. So uh, we... We tend not to employ um, expatriate staff uh, unless they have specific skills which are not available locally. Um, so uh, our, you know, European staff will all be based in the, the European offices. Um, so we, there's a couple of exceptions in particularly specialist areas, but as far as possible, we, uh, we recruit locally. Um, but certainly, uh, what we're doing a lot more is research collaboration. So we are collaborating a lot with researchers in Irish institutions and uh, other European and US institutions. So we do have opportunities for um, early career researchers. Um, so that would be an opportunity rather than actually working as sort of expatriates overseas. I suppose one final one there. It, do, uh, what adverse effects do uh, can food aid have on agricultural production? Okay, um, we're not, well, humanitarian work is a very small part of what we do, um, but it, it will expand. Um, it can have a hugely detrimental impact on local agriculture. 
Um, so like most NGOs now, particularly in the humanitarian sector, we're trying to discourage food aid. We're trying to move away to move towards providing cash. If you can provide cash to people in a, an emergency, in a crisis, they can then use that cash to buy food and the market will generally respond and provide the food. Now, you know, it's not always the case. You can have cases where people are cut off by floods or by wars who will still need the classic convoy of UN uh, World Food Programme trucks. But actually, those situations are relatively rare. Um, I mean, you know, we have in Malawi, for example, Malawi, very different agroecological systems between the south and the north. Um, so when it's a drought in the south, it's usually, you know, have good rains in the north. By providing farmers who have no food in the south with cash, that stimulates the local market. So traders will then purchase crops in the north and transport them to the south. So we are, and most uh, NGOs are moving towards cash, or if not cash, then at least vouchers to try and stimulate the local economy rather than providing food aid, which often kills the local economy. You mentioned in your presentation, and, uh, and Mark's looking at me uh, uh, saying we're nearly finished, uh, the, the uh, focus on, on markets and market access for, for, for smallholders. Uh, how important is that in your, in your work? Okay, um, for South Africa, we will consider farming to be an enterprise. It, it is a commercial enterprise. And I know other NGOs would disagree strongly with this position, but we feel in the, you know, in the 21st century, if you're not making enough money out of agriculture, there's something wrong. Okay, I mean, it's obviously the same issue, but Chagas in Ireland, people have to make a decent living, uh, you know, a fair living out of agriculture. So that does mean linking farmers into value chains and supply chains. It means making sure that farmers can access inputs, the inputs they need. Um, the choice of inputs, again, for instance, seed, we see a, a pluralistic seed system where farmers are allowed to save their own seed, exchange seed, if that's for what they want, or to go to the local agro-input shop and purchase seed from whichever seed company they want to. You know, we are not saying we won't, don't want to drive the commercial seed sector out. Um, we, we see there's a, a strong role for them. And in fact, what's very exciting in Southern Africa is the number of seed companies which have started up. You know, 10 years ago, we all assumed the seed industry will be dominated by Syngenta and Monsanto, and actually that's not the case at all. You know, Malawi now has 20, over 20 different indigenous seed companies. So it's all about building up local enterprises, both from the supply sector and the uh, utilizing the products that are coming out of our farms. Okay, uh, Paul, I'm afraid, and Pat, I'm afraid we're, we're going to have to wrap <laughs> it up there. Uh, as much as I'd love to, to continue the conversation, uh, we, we try to wrap up the, the webinars, try, try to keep it within the hour because uh, we know that people have other commitments. Uh, Paul, if, if somebody wants to get involved or reach out to Self-Help Africa, what's the best way to do that? Okay, if you look, look, look on our website, obviously you can contact us through the website. We're trying to... Uh, you know, add to the list of technical publications available through through the website. Uh, so our library is slowly increasing. Um, so the best way is, is through the website or see, you know, through yourself, you can you can forward emails on to me for anybody from right. Vegas. I'm also happy if you uh, if you can save the questions uh, that people have posted, yes. I can provide answers to those. We can do that for sure. We'll see uh, some very some very good questions here. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. Very, very uh very intelligent questions coming yeah. through this morning. Yeah. So thought provoking. Um, look, we, we will wrap it up at that. Um, thank you so much, Paul, for, for mm -hmm. that uh, enlightening presentation. It's always good for us to, 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 to look at what's happening in, in other parts of the world and, and lessons that we can learn and, and, uh, and vice versa as well. So uh, we, we will certainly keep in touch with you, Paul, and maybe we'll have you back again to, to give us another update in, in the future. Um, Pat, thanks for helping with the questions this morning. And uh, I also want to thank uh, our production team, uh, Andy Boland, uh, Catherine Keena, Pat Murphy, and Yvonne Maher, uh, uh, who, who are organizing all of the, the talks in the background and, and uh, doing all the hard work. Um, and uh, just to remind you as well, you might have seen at the intro, there's a, a conference or a webinar taking place next, uh, next week, the 3rd of March 
Uh, it uh, relates to the, uh, the use of legumes um, within uh, agriculture uh, it, and how legumes can reduce nitrogen uh, within the agricultural systems. So that uh, takes place online on uh, next Tuesday, I think it is, uh, the 3rd of March. And so you can log on to, the, uh, to that or register for that through the Chagas website. So finally, thank you for tuning in this morning. And uh, we do hope you have a, a nice weekend. And um, thanks again for watching. So we will talk to you next week. Uh, next week, we'll be uh, joined by a representative from Carberry, who's going to be talking about their journey uh, on uh, around sustainability. Uh, so we look forward to that. So thanks again.